Good morning to a very he full house. Uh, I think uh, our, we have distinguished guests with us and uh, ICDDRB scientists are aware of it. So they're all from the Oxford University and from the area of emerging infectious diseases and global health. Today we have uh, knighted and dames and very special people with us. So first I can uh, introduce Professor um, Peter uh, Horby, who's going to give us a talk on designing clinical trials for emerging infectious diseases. And as you know, Peter, you've heard about how good we are at clinical trials. So with that, we, I'm sure we're going to do many things together. And also with us, we have uh, Professor Piero Oliaro, who's already worked with Dinesh. I saw them shaking hands, and we heard about Ishmael's work that they've done. And he also has a background, similar background, on respiratory and uh, infectious diseases. And we have Professor Dame Sarah Gilbert. All of us know about her, probably. It's the AstraZeneca vaccine from Oxford University. So uh, the talk will be by uh, Peter, uh, by Sir Peter. But uh, we'll have in the audience very distinguished people. And we can ask questions and uh, uh, hear very nice things. Thank you so much, all three of you, for coming and for Peter for agreeing to give us a talk. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's a huge uh, privilege and a huge pleasure to be here. Um, your institution is, is world famous, and I've known about it uh, my entire career. Um, so it's a real pleasure to finally visit you um, and to see all the fantastic work you've been doing. Uh, my background is, is infectious diseases, clinical medicine, and uh, clinical research. I've been working on emerging infectious diseases for about 20 years. Um, I started with um, mad cow disease, the, uh, the emerging infection that the UK gave the world, but luckily that didn't take off, um, and then moved on to avian influenza and been working on Ebola and Lassa and, and other diseases, and more recently working on COVID-19 where we led the recovery trial um, of treatments uh, in, from my group. So I wanted to talk to you today about some sort of lessons I've learned over the last two decades on trying to design clinical trials for emerging infectious diseases. Um, and so what I want to do is to talk first about sort of our past failures um, of doing good patient-based research in epidemic prone infectious diseases, talk about what the challenges are, because those failures are not due to you know, lack of people's abilities, it really is because emerging infections pose some particular challenges to doing patient-based research. Then talk about what progress we have made and could make, uh, and then some concluding remarks. So you'll all know that you know, emerging infections are, um, are, are reasonably common. Uh, this, this is one slide which I've, I've chosen because it starts and ends with, with Nipah virus, um, which is the reason that we're visiting uh, your institution today. Um, it starts um, with the um, uh, discovery of Nipah in 1998 and finishes up here in 2018 with the, uh, the outbreak uh, in India. But um, there's a very long history of pandemics you know, go going back um, throughout history. Um, but what is you know, quite stark, I think, is not a lot has changed in terms of um, how we respond. We're still doing the same things. We're still doing quarantine, social distancing. Um, we're still seeing um, you know, carts full of the dead. This is from um, the, the Great Plague in London. Um, this is from West Africa. And this is from the US with COVID-19. You know, very similar pictures over, over many centuries um, where we are not um, able to control these diseases. Um, and we failed to advance the clinical care for many of these infections. When Ebola was first identified in Yambuka in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1976, this is a photograph from that, uh, the setting where the hospital outbreak occurred, and the case fatality rate then was 80%. This is a photograph of a ward in uh, West Africa in 2014. It's hardly any different. Um, and the death rate was 70%, hardly any different. And then uh, another, the, the, the most recent large outbreak in uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, 
um, in 2019, case fatality rate of 63%. So we've really made very little progress in the care of these patients over the years. Um, we have seen improvements in um, laboratory technologies, um, and you know, this is some photographs taken from a Lassa fever uh, laboratory uh, in Africa, where you know, there is fairly advanced and high-tech diagnostic and research equipment, but this is the board. Um, so we're spending money on lab equipment and lab studies, we're not spending money on improving patient care. And so that's really been one of my sort of driving ambitions, is that I think we spend too long and too much money um, describing these infections, not actually doing anything to improve the care of patients and the outcome of patients. And it's unacceptable, I think, you know, which I've seen, is a laboratory with probably a million pounds worth of equipment and a ward where the patient is on um, a piece of wood um, with, with no care other than an intravenous drip. Uh, we really need to come back to the patients. You know, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we need to sort of um, save lives and stop transmission. Uh, this is a, an example of Lassa fever, um, um, where the current treatment for Lassa fever, which is a viral hemorrhagic fever in Africa, which we're working on, is a drug called ribavirin, which many of you will know, an, uh, an antiviral drug. Um, the the patients are all treated with ribavirin based on one study done in the 1970s, where actually, if you go back to the original data, the case fatality rate is higher in the patients given ribavirin than the patients not given ribavirin. And if you go back to the original data, the, uh, the US military did the study, and their conclusion is that any, any results should be interpreted with extreme caution as there's, substanti um, there's substantial biases in the data. So we've been treating patients with ribavirin in Africa for uh, you know, decades based on very unreliable data. Uh, we may actually be harming patients. And there really isn't an excuse that this hasn't been progressed in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, another example, this is monkeypox, um, which is endemic in parts of Africa. Um, there is a drug, Tecaviramat, which was developed and approved by the US FDA for treatment of smallpox, but as you can't test anybody with smallpox because it's been eradicated, the drug was actually evaluated in animal models of monkeypox, and it worked extremely well in animal models of monkeypox. On that basis, it was approved by uh, regulators for use in smallpox, and was purchased and stockpiled at a very large cost uh, in various countries, but that drug is not available to patients with monkeypox in Africa. So you have a drug tested on monkeypox, approved for treatment, stockpiled in Western countries, not available to patients in Africa, where the case fatality rate in children is about 10%. You know, again, um, I think we're, we're missing huge opportunities to improve patient care. And if you look at the WHO priority diseases for research and development of emerging infections, uh, which I've listed here from the 2017 list, um, you can see many of them have been around for a very long time. So Lassa fever from the 70s, CCHF 70s, you know, Ebola, Marburg 70s, etc. Go down here, uh, Nippo in 98. Um, so they've been around a long time, and yet for none of these is there effective treatments and vaccines, which is why they're on this list. So, you know, we've, we've wasted a lot of time, um, and we shouldn't waste any more time in trying to find effective treatments and vaccines for these, for these diseases. Um, and um, this is a good example, is, um, you know, influenza It's one of the best known pandemic threats. We have it every year in an endemic form, so we can study it. Um, we know we're going to get our, an influenza pandemic at some point, so we should be ready for it. Uh, we did get an influenza pandemic in 2009 um, at a time where there are no approved antivirals for severe influenza. The only approved antivirals are approved for outpatients with mild influenza. None of them have proven efficacy in severe influenza. And so when the outbreak started, uh, there were a lot of people who wanted to do therapeutic trials or other observational trials um, in patients. So this bar on the left 
is um, the cumulative number of patients who were supposed to be enrolled in trials based on studies that were registered in uh, clinicaltrials.gov and other registries. Oh, sorry. Um, this is the, the actual number of patients enrolled. So, uh, you know, less than 2,000 patients. This is a global pandemic. We don't have antivirals for severe influenza. Uh, hardly any patients enrolled in clinical trials. And l less than 200 patients was the data actually published. So, pandemic influenza uh, don't have any treatments for severe disease. There are candidates, a complete failure to enrol patients during a, during a pandemic. Um, so you've all seen epidemic curves. Um, so there's kind of a, an unfortunate epidemic curve of ambition where lots of people want to um, have ideas, but it doesn't really translate into patients and or nor evidence. So we still don't have any antivirals approved for severe influenza um, a decade after the pandemic, um, and there's no excuse for it. Uh, what we want to do is to shift that curve. Let's try and actually get some of these products properly evaluated in patients and improve patient care. Um, so why have we failed? It's not just because people are, you know, don't want to do it. It's actually because it is very challenging. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge those challenges. Um, one of them is that outbreaks are very unpredictable but by their nature. Um, this is um, Middle East respiratory coronavirus, MERS coronavirus, you know, one of the coronaviruses with you know, fa fairly severe disease. Endemic uh, in parts of, of the Middle East with you know, sporadic transmission from camels to humans uh, and with some outbreaks in hospital settings generally. And these are you know, cases in, in, in Saudi Arabia um, over several years. So you know, not many cases and um, difficult to study. Um, and then suddenly, a big outbreak in South Korea. So if you were wanting to study MERS coronavirus, you would be trying to study it in Saudi Arabia. But actually, you know, one of the biggest outbreaks was in South Korea from an imported case from Saudi Arabia. So you need to be able to deal with that unpredictability about where the outbreaks are going to occur. You need to be able to shift your trial from Saudi to South Korea uh, within a period of weeks. Uh, this is uh, avian influenza, H5N1 cases. Um, by geographic uh, location of cases, you can see a whole range of countries. Uh, you can see Bangladesh is in here in pink, so a few number of cases. So you can get, you know, a, a, at the high level, enough cases to do a clinical study. But if they're distributed across multiple countries, it makes it very challenging. And then you get a big outbreak uh, in Egypt, where you wouldn't particularly expect to see a that big outbreak of cases. So. Again, um, a real predictability problem with zoonotic infections. And even if you can predict the country where the cases will occur, they're often very distributed across many hospitals, and this is you know, of, often the case also with, with Nipper as well. So this is H7N9, another um, avian influenza virus with quite severe disease, um, high case fatality. Um, 660 cases, so probably enough cases to do a clinical trial. Um, over three years, but distributed across 258 hospitals, um, you know, across a very large part of China. So again, um, at, the, at the high level, enough patients for a trial, but very challenging when they're distributed across hundreds of hospitals. Um, so that's one challenge, unpredictability about location and timing. The other one is they're often very fast. So you haven't got long, you really have to move quickly. So this is the SARS epidemic in Hong Kong, um, and it's just really to demonstrate that, that the outbreak is about sort of six to eight weeks, and that's actually what you can expect for most outbreaks. If you're going to have a person-to-person -person transmission that's uh, with an R less than one, where you won't get sustained transmission, it's probably only going to last six to eight weeks. So you have a very short window to do your trial. And this is uh, again H7N9 cases um, in China, and you can see um, it's. Um, periodic, but again, the period of transmission is quite short, again, six, about six to eight weeks, so um, you have to be uh, able to capture most of the cases by doing a trial that starts right at the beginning of the outbreak. Uh, and this is the, is the, 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 the initial Nipper outbreak um, in, in Malaysia, where again, you can see that the, the peak of cases 
here is over a fairly short period. So if you want to enrol those patients, you really have to be ready to, to um, get out of the starting block straight away. Um, and then we have the problem of incomplete knowledge. When you're designing trials, um, you have, um, often if you're doing chronic diseases, you have a very good understanding of the disease, the clinical epidemiology, the natural history of the disease. But often, emerging infections are relatively rare, so you have a sort of rare diseases challenge. You have small numbers of patients, the understanding of the disease the clinical course may be incomplete, um, there may be no validated measures of disease progression, um, and there may be no definition of what standard of care is. So this is, this actually, this slide is about rare chronic diseases, but it all applies really to emerging infections in many ways. So we should con conceptualize it as, as a kind of rare disease problem where we have incomplete understanding um, of the infections that we're dealing with. And so, you know, if you're dealing, you, you want to do a clinical trial. Traditionally, you have a, you know, you need a focus, answerable question, a hypothesis. If you give intervention, whatever, X, to patients with disease Y, then your hypothesis is that it result in improved outcomes compared to treatment Z, the standard of care. And then you need patience and time. Um, but if you take that sort of hypothesis with an emerging infection, you have some real problems. You know, um, the intervention you're going to use, well, often there's little investment in experience, so you know, there, it's very hard to find any new interventions for Nipah virus or Lassa fever because there's no markets for developing those drugs. So there are very few drugs to test. Um, Patients, uh, often the clinical phenotype is uncertain, so um, if you want to enrol patients, how do you define a case, how do you define severity, um, how do you stratify by risk factors because you don't really understand the clinical phenotype. If you want to measure improvement, well, um, often that's difficult. If you don't know what the baseline is and what the natural history is, um, then it's very hard to predefine what your expectation is in terms of clinical improvement. Um, treat, uh, you know, comparing treatment X against treatment Z, if treatment Z is the standard of care, what if there is no standard of care, there's no proven comparator? Um, what do you compare it against? And then patients are obviously unpredictable and timing is unpredictable. So you have sometimes real difficulty in defining um, a clinical trial for an emerging infection because there's so much uncertainty. And often a very challenging context in which to, to respond. There's, there's both the sort of the emergency nature, uh, which is of, often um, a lot of public health response, but trying to do research at the same time is difficult, and often research is perceived as a luxury, um, which I think we really need to push back against that. You know, if we want to manage the second outbreak differently, we have to conduct research to understand um, how we improve patient care and reduce transmission. So research should be seen as a core pillar of outbreak response, not a luxury. Um, but it's difficult because everyone's uh, busy, it's difficult because it's often highly political, and it's difficult because the contexts where outbreaks occur are often very poorly resourced. Uh, and there may be other issues, logistical issues. This is the trials we, we did in Ebola in West Africa where um, there's transport difficulties, there's security difficulties. Um, your source data verification is difficult when actually all the source data is burnt uh, because of infection control risks, so you can't even keep the consent forms. Um, and there's, um, um, there's community um, resistance against the, both the responders and the researchers. So in terms of sort of um, where emerging infections sit uh, in the landscape of doing clinical research, um, I, I, I've just made up this slide where if you look at the market barriers, you know, who's going to make a drug or a treatment for, for a particular disease? Um, the market barriers are low for things like cardiovascular disease, where it's a chronic disease, you can dose people for 30 years, and the people who have cardiovascular disease are rich and can pay for the drug. Um, it gets harder and harder with cancers and AMR, um, rare non-communicable diseases, but epidemic infections, the, the market for um, selling those drugs is very difficult. You know, it's an unpredictable market and often the people affected don't have any money. And so there's not an incentive um, for creating interventions. So there's high market barriers. 
And then the epidemiological, methodological, and contextual barriers, as I've discussed, they're also extremely high um, for emerging infectious diseases for all, all the reasons I've said. So the reasons we've seen these failures in the past is because of this, is that the market and the, and the contextual barriers are extremely high for emerging infections. So how do we make progress? So that, you know, I don't want to be pessimistic, you know, uh, it's, it's a difficult area, but how do we actually make progress? How do we improve um, our understanding and our care of patients with these infections? Well, there's a few things. One is um, <clears throat> building clinical research networks and partnerships, uh, improving our clinical epidemiology and understanding so we can design the trials well, preparing clinical development plans so we have a strategy of how we're going to evaluate these drugs, um, and then developing clinical trials methodologies. Um, so going through those, um, there has been investment in research networks, um, and you know, this is one, this is ISRIC, the International Severe Acute Respiratory Infections Consortium, of which I'm the chief executive. You know, there are 54 ISRIC members in 130 countries, so uh, everywhere, you know, it's really an ISRIC, has ISRIC members uh, of clinical research networks who are interested in emerging infections. And we have, through ISRIC, you know, studies ongoing in Lassa fever, uh, Ebola, MERS, monkeypox, plague, um, and um, the recovery trial um, is now uh, international as well, and working international. So I think these networks are really important ways to bring together researchers across the world to pool resources to respond quickly. Uh, clinical epidemiology, I think if you can get a good understanding of an infection, then you're in a much better place to understand what might work, what might reduce uh, fatality and poor outcomes. Um, and again, the networks are very useful. So um, ISERIC, we, we established the biggest clinical database for COVID-19. Uh, we have data on almost a million now hospitalized COVID-19 patients from 1,700 sites around the world from more than 60 countries. So we have a very extensive database. Um, we do um, uh, lots of analysis and publications of those data with the data contributors in a very uh, equitable way. Uh, and it has informed uh, understanding of COVID quite extensively, um, both in terms of this is just showing the um, you know, clinical, clinical clustering, this is host genetic studies, uh, this is looking at the implementation um, of clinical guidelines, so looking at the use of steroids before and after the publication of the recovery results on dexamethasone, um, looking at how well uh, clinical care is improving. Uh, and this is another study we're doing, uh, we're doing a treatment trial in plague. Um, how do you measure improvement in plague? Um, well, plague is mostly bubonic plague. How do you measure improvement in bubonic plague? Well, it's very difficult. Um, so we've been looking at, looking at the, um, how the bubo, the affected lymph node, uh, reduces in size as our clinical endpoint for our study. Um, and so we've been doing some sub-studies looking at how you measure bubo size using calipers or ultrasound, um, because unless you've defined your clinical endpoints, it's very, you can't do your study or your endpoint is not validated. Uh, then clinical development plans, this is about developing a strategy. If you had a drug, uh, better drug for Lassa fever, if you had a better drug for Nipah virus or a better drug for coronavirus, how would you evaluate it? Um, to do that, you've really got to sort of go through a process of developing a strategy. Um, developing um, clinical endpoints, how are you going to stratify patients clinically by severity or, or disease presentation, disease phenotype, how are you going to measure success in terms of the clinical treatment and how are you going to, to actually do a trial of, of that disease. And so um, we've established the West Africa Lassa Fever Consortium with colleagues in West Africa to try and go through a very systematic process of defining a clinical strategy for evaluating ways to improve the care of Lassa fever. And then uh, clinical trials uh, and methods development. So because of the, the issues about uncertainty, numbers, timing, um, we've done quite a lot of work and others have on um, developing um, study designs, um, which include um, different types of trial designs, um, using uh, ordinal outcomes as opposed to sort of uh, fixed outcomes, um, using uh, rate ratios as opposed to absolute um, rates, um, different ways of dealing with the uncertainty around um, the disease, natural history, and, and the number of cases, etc. And this one here, you know, a protocol for how you would <coughs> start a study in one outbreak and then 
stop and start it again in another outbreak. So if your outbreak isn't big enough, you don't just stop and say, we haven't got enough data, here's the incomplete data. You actually um, keep the trial in mothballs and then you reopen it for the next study, the next trial. And you accumulate data across, across studies. Um, and then critically, um, streamlining trials. So in recovery, <coughs> we put a lot of effort into really doing a very streamlined platform trial, um, which is, um, uh, has been extremely successful. And this is um, a paper by um, the, uh, uh, the, the heads of the, um, of the FDA in the US saying what, what the US can learn from the UK recovery trial about doing super efficient trials. Um, very um, low um, requirements on healthcare workers so that you can enroll large numbers and get very reliable results. Um, so, you know, I, I put up some problems and, and here's some potential solutions. Um, interventions, we need to you know, invest in the R&D pipelines, invest in drug discovery, uh, vaccine development and evidence appraisals, including you know, what's best supportive care and what repurposed drugs we might use um, to improve care. You know, one of the <coughs> biggest successes in COVID treatment was you know, very cheap dexamethasone, uh, and that's the kind of um, in, in impact we want to see, uh, very widely usable interventions. Um, if you don't know how to stratify your patients by severity, then there are generic severity scores that you can use that, that can be applied to any, any clinical syndrome. Um, if you don't know um, how you're going to measure improvement and what level of improvement you might, might need, you can look at odds ratios um, where you haven't got a predefined outcome rate at baseline. Um, and if you don't know what the outcomes are going to be clinically and you can't pre-specify them, you can use ordinal outcome scales such as WHO um, uh, um, has promoted for COVID-19, like you know, are you on ICU, uh, are you not on ICU but requiring oxygen, are you on the ward without oxygen or are you home? So these are very generic ordinal scales that you can use of severity <coughs> to measure outcomes if you don't understand um, your disease natural history, you can still design your trial using these generic scales. Um, if you haven't got a, um, um, a comparator, you can design trials where you just compare the outcomes between arms without a fixed control. So there are designs where you don't have to pre-specify your control arm. You can do three interventions and just see which one is best without pre-specifying a control. And if you if your patient numbers are limited, then I think you know what's critical is simple designs. There are many, many barriers to enrolling patients. Doctors and nurses are very, very busy, always. And so if you want to make it easy for them, you have to sort of almost embed the trial in routine care, make it um, very simple. Um, and then you can have, um, oops, excuse me. Um, you can use um, different sort of adaptive designs that can help you get answers quicker. And again, the time short, when time scale is very short, very simple trial designs allow you to implement very quickly um, and allow you to move the trial very quickly. You can have early endpoints so you get results quickly, sequential analysis, adaptive design. So there are various techniques you can use to make it much easier to study difficult infections and to get results quickly. Um, and just some examples of, of, of where progress has been made. This is our Ebola trial that we did. You can set up, you can deal with the fact that you can't keep source records. You can take digital photographs of the consent forms and the data. Um, you can load that in a tent, on, uh, upload them to, cl to cloud databases, and you can do sterile drug manufacturing in, in mobile kits. You can do you know, high quality randomized control trials almost anywhere if, if you are set up to do it. And so we made progress in Ebola for sure, and I think it's a good example of where you can make progress. Um, and if you can make progress in Ebola, then you can make progress anywhere. You know, it, it's, it occurs in very difficult circumstances. Um, it's, it's contagious, it's, it's, it's very severe, and there's a lot of politics around. Um, um, and it occurs in, in, in very poor countries. Uh, you can see this is the West Africa outbreak where um, these, were ran, these were trials that were opened um, towards the end of the outbreak, but you know, clinical trials were implemented successfully in an extremely difficult circumstance. And then that lesson then was taken forward to the DRC Ebola outbreak uh, in 2018-2020.
um, where the first patient was enrolled in a randomized controlled trial quite early in the outbreak. Um, and enrollment was completed during the outbreak. Um, and we ended up where we actually made real progress, where we did find um, treatments that were effective um, in, in Ebola um, doing, a, doing a trial under very difficult circumstances. So we've moved um, from a situation with Ebola where we had no treatments and no trials to a situation where we now have um, approved therapeutics for some types of Ebola virus disease that do reduce mortality significantly. Um, and we're now working on the um, a, a protocol for the Sudan Ebola virus outbreak in Uganda, which is a different serotype. And we're using this method where the, the trial is pre-designed um, so that it can be um, used and, and recruiting across different outbreaks. So we're using a different design uh, where it's a platform trial so we can add and take away different treatments. We're using a factorial design, so we're now looking at immunomodulation as well as antivirals in Ebola. And we're designing it so that we can open it in one outbreak and then reopen it in another outbreak so that we can um, do even better in Ebola. Um, and I think we made real progress in COVID. So um, with colleagues in China, we were involved right from the early days uh, in Wuhan. Um, this goes from here, January um, of 2020. And we opened the first randomized controlled trial, which was a randomized controlled trial of Lipinavir ritonavir. Um, so it was versus standard of care, open label. Um, and we opened that within 20 days. So most trials take, you know, one or two years to start at least. Uh, but, you know, we've now got to the stage where we have the expertise that we can open a randomized controlled trial within 20 days. Um, and we opened the second trial um, up here, which was a placebo-controlled randomized trial in about uh, 35 days. But the epidemic declined very quickly afterwards in Wuhan, so we then had to move the trial out of China to where the outbreak was spreading. Um, and so we were enrolling patients, this was the first patient enrolled in, in January 18 in Wuhan into the first randomized controlled trial. Uh, and by March, we were enrolling, this is the first patient enrolled in the recovery trial in Oxford, um, March 19, 2020. So, um, a few months from moving uh, you know, a first randomized control trial at the epicenter of the outbreak to a completely different setting um, with a slightly different design. And so the recovery trial, we designed that um, <coughs> to be a very simple trial. <coughs> and I think the point is, is that randomized trials don't have to be complicated. They must be practical. And so we had very simple eligibility, hospitalized with SARS-CoV-2, that's it, that's your eligibility criteria. A uh, simple outcome, did you die or not by tw day 28? Uh, you were randomised between suitable and available treatments. Thank you. Um, so if the drug is not available, then you're not randomised to it. But if it is, you can be randomised to it. So very flexible to what's available at the site. And the follow-up was a one-page case report form. So you know, a very different style of trial than many people have been used to, where it's a, it takes six minutes to randomise a patient. The, the system clicks the data on how long it takes to randomize a patient. So when you open uh, a case report form to start entering patient on the data, to the time that you, on the screen, it tells you what drugs to give the patient after randomization is completed, it's six minutes, that's all it takes. And then you give the patient the drug, and then it's a one-page follow-up form. Um, and that's why recovery was successful, because it focused on what was important, did not collect extraneous data. And as a result, in a recovery, we recruited over 48,000 patients, uh, more than 84,000 randomizations. Um, and you can see here, this is the recruitment in the UK. Uh, and in the first wave, we were recruiting almost 400 patients per day into recovery. And we could only do that because it was a, um, a highly simplified trial. And in um, the second big wave, we even beat that. At one point, we were enrolling 500 patients per day which is bigger than most COVID trials, full stop. We were enrolling that number of patients per day. Um, and as a result, you know, it's, it's, it's changed uh, global practice. We've got 11 results so far, um, you know, seven drugs that clearly don't work with very, very clear data that they don't work um, because they were so large. And the numbers are the numbers in the active uh, um, part of the trial. So 
for each of these you can double the number of patients because there's that number of controls as well. You know, so we had you know, 2,000 patients treated on dexamethasone, 7,000 on aspirin, um, nearly 6,000 given convalescent plasma. Um, very large numbers, giving very clear results both overall and in subgroups that really change practice. And four uh, clear um, um, effective drugs that improve survival, dexamethasone, uh, tocilizumab, uh, baricitinib, and neutralizing antibodies. Um, and we've still got more to come. We're doing high-dose dexamethasone, empagliflozin, a diabetes drug, uh, citrolimab, molnupiravir, and Paxlovid. So we've still got more to go. Uh, and we've now gone international, so recovery is now open in Ghana, India, Indonesia, Nepal, South Africa, the Gambia, and Vietnam. And we're adding influenza, because we don't want to be in the situation we were in 2019, where if there's a pandemic, we don't get any new answers. There are new drugs for influenza. And so then it, we're now opening um, recovery you know, for influenza as well. Um, and so I think one of the, the legacies, there's lots of legacies that have been talked about for the recovery trial, but for me this is the big one. Uh, this is an uh, a, a admissions board in intensive care in the UK, which many of you will be familiar with. You know, the, the patient's name will be here, uh, date of admission, diagnosis, micro results and treatment, but the, the, the staff have added a column for COVID trial. You know, which trial are you in? If you're being admitted to hospital with a disease and we don't know how to optimise the treatment of it, let's put the patient in a trial and let's make the trial simple enough so that every patient can be in a trial and that way we'll learn something and we'll learn something quickly. Um, and so broader lessons from the pandemic. So clinical trials um, can deliver huge benefits in epidemic infections, so we need to do them. Um, and most of the treatment recommendations in WHO have come from non-pharmaceutical studies. They come from uh, academic-led studies. So we can do this. Um, uh, and to do that, we need to fund more trials and fund better trials, set more, uh, smart trials, uh, platform trials. Um, but poor clinical trials waste money and resources. This was a WA, uh, an FDA review of, of randomised controlled trials in COVID-19, showing that... Um, the vast majority, 95% of the trials, were underpowered and poorly designed. So 95% of clinical trials in COVID were designed to fail uh, and would not give you uh, an actionable answer. So a lot of money and a lot of patients was wasted on poor trials. So the lesson from that is don't fund poor trials and we should really be very critical about what trials are being funded and being done because we don't want to waste patients or waste resources when we're not going to get any uh, evidence from those trials that will improve care. Um, speed is essential. Uh, in recovery it was 90 days to our first answer and within uh, 100 days we had three answers and, that's, and that included um, dexamethasone. Um, so um, to make things fast you need to simplify trials. You need to simplify the design, simplify regulations and simplify contracting. Um, scale is essential. Another, bit, you know, for lots of reasons. Uh, one scale is essential because with emerging infections, if you've got small case numbers, you need to try and get as many of those cases as possible. Um, but if you've got big case numbers, you still need big numbers because you want to look at effects in subgroups and, and have uh, not just know the drug works, but in who does it work. And so um, trials like recovery allowed us to look at differential effects. And this is looking at the effects of monoclonal antibodies based on whether you're um, zero negative, whether you're antibody negative at baseline, in which case uh, giving more antibody improves your survival, or whether you're antibody positive with your own antibodies at baseline, in which case um, giving antibodies makes no difference. So you can really focus your resources. So to get the scale you need, what you need to do, you need to simplify trials, simplify the design, the regulation, the contracts. And I think that's a really important message is we must um, move away from the highly complex trial designs that um, we're now all being um, expected to, to follow for no, not necessarily good reasons. Um, Low-income countries uh, are disadvantaged, that's very clear. Um, both pre-COVID and during COVID, most trials are done in high-income countries. This is a, uh, um, a paper looking at the number of patients involved in clinical trials. It's the size of the bubble is the number of patients enrolled in different clinical trials by high, middle, lower, and low, the lowest income countries. And you can see most of the trials in high 
middle-income countries and very few in low-income countries. So we have to do something to shift that balance so that trials are done and are applicable and useful for people in low-income settings. So to do that, we need to simplify trials because resources are limited in, in, in low-income countries. And so complex trials are more expensive and are harder to do. Um, and we need to support NMICs by adding resources, but also subtracting the burden. The burden of clinical trials is so heavy that even for high-income countries and, and, and well-resourced universities like the University of Oxford, doing clinical trials is a huge headache because there's such a requirement, a regulatory requirement. And I think we need to um, remove some of that. Um, and we need to support networking and partnership. We need to make sure that, there's, that the resources are shared around so that um, the, the, the better resourced institutions can support the lower resourced institutions. Um, and trust and confidence are essential. You know, this is the, another um, big uh, COVID trial, the REMAP CAP trial in intensive care um, that is open across many countries, but it was started nine years ago. It took nine years to develop that ICU network for REMAP CAP. And so it's not about you know starting with you can start a trial in nine days because you've done nine years of preparation. So you've got to start building those relationships um, between institutions, but also with communities right right from the outset. Um, so we need to support that networking and partnership. Um, so in conclusions, is is um, we do need to do something because we've neglected these diseases for dec decades, and patient uh, the case fatality is often high and we're almost certain that that can be improved and can be reduced. Um, we've made some progress. We're now, we're now, I think, understanding what we need to do um, to make sure that these diseases um, um, are studied properly and we do improve care. And the things we need to do is you know, smarter funding of trials um, and smarter trial design um, that takes into account all of those difficulties that I talked about. Um, and being aware that not one size will fit all. There's not one trial design that will work for every context. We need to think about the diversity of trials. Um, we need to try to build simple trials that are embedded in routine care. So it's part of your good quality care is to enrol patients in studies that will give evidence that will improve care. We need to work to reduce trial regulation and get proportionate guidance, and we, we are doing that, but I think it's, it's important that all of us um, challenge the regulators. Um, I think sometimes the regulators are seen as, as, um, as all powerful, when actually regulators can be convinced um, sometimes to take a different view and a more pragmatic view um, when it's in the interests of patients, and the alternative is there will be no improvement in evidence. Uh, we should be investing in platforms, uh, clinical trial platforms, um, partnerships and platform trials. Um, we've seen the huge power of um, good platform trials as opposed to the uh, wasted resource of, you know, of individual sequential underpowered trials is a huge waste. Um, so we should all be thinking about you know, partnerships and platforms. Uh, develop tools and services to help clinical investigators. I think you know, this is where the funders play a role. They should be helping the investigators with, with um, you know, data sharing plans, community engagement plans, all the things that are now required, those things should be offered as, uh, as help to principal investigators so that um, principal investigators are supported um, um, to do important trials. And you know, to be ready, to be able to do the trials that we're talking about, you need to be prepared. You need to understand the epidemiology. You need to have thought about the clinical trial design. You need to have thought about the drugs you're going to use. And you need to be doing. So you need to actually start trials. If you can't do a trial in Nipper, let's do trials in encephalitis. If you can't do trials in MERS coronavirus because there's not enough cases, let's have COVID platforms or influenza platforms that we can switch over to MERS coronavirus if we need to. And that way, I think we will start to improve care for emerging infections in the future. Um, and I'm hoping um, that um, the lessons from COVID will be learned and that we will, um, in the next um, five, ten years, be seeing a much stronger infrastructure across the world so that we can improve care for endemic, uh, but also epidemic infectious diseases. Um, thank you very much.